I did my video a while back explaining the closest thing that I have to a life path, which is dabbling in Tantra. I think about that video occasionally. I was very reluctant to make it. Um, it stuck in my mind, simply because I know that when you start to discuss things that interest you that deeply, but are that esoteric, um, it's going to sound stupid. I thought I would get a lot more criticism I, than I actually ended up getting for that video, and I was quite prepared, and prepared to show some extreme tolerance for criticism that I got, but didn't come. Imagine that. I guess the fact that most people understand that when you're talking about truths at the experiential level, you're guaranteed to be misunderstood. So, I guess I should thank everybody for being, <laughs> you know, nice. But, this subject still fascinates me. And one of the things that I find Tantra interests me so much for is the fact that it says that, or it posits the view that just about everything can be experienced. Um, I talk about becoming a lot. The, um, the What it actually means to be inside Pyro's information stream from the inside, viewing it as an active participant as an active part of the information stream. Information from the outside comes in, information goes out in the form of will, desire. So that's what's happening. What does the experience feel like? Um, we create memories, the Hindus would call them, call this karma, in order to make sense out of um, the present or the future form and everything are all con the constructs that we have created in our past that enable us to deal with becoming, because apparently becoming in its purest form, you can remove all um, outside or all of your own constructs from the process of becoming, uh, of being in that information stream, but you're without the, po the capacity to manage it in any way at all, i.e. no form, <laughs> uh, then you become, as I say, like that prisoner who's jerked out of Plato's cave and tossed blindly into the sunlight without any explanation as to what was going to happen. All of his constructs are gone. You hear that? That's gamelan music from Indonesia. Sort of the original jazz. It's a type of music where harmony is unknown, and you often don't write down the music. It's not actual forms. You just get there. You just a bunch of musicians show up and jam, as it were, you know, sort of a jazz kind of way. <clears throat> it sounds chaotic to the Western ear. It often sounds like noise. It's ironic because the guys that I've got playing in the background here are Hungarians. They're not even uh, Indonesians, but they seem to get it. They seem to get the idea. Just sit down and play. You'll have, you know, somebody who's sort of leading everything, but everybody follows in their own way, in their own the way that they want to. Schopenhauer said that music is the closest thing to pure will. Maybe. I, like, I, I actually agree with Schopenhauer a lot. I disagree with his conclusions because I don't think he took them to their logical conclusion, or perhaps he took them to a logical conclusion dealing with his own axioms as facts. Um, that's his error, if you ask me. Um, he was onto a lot of good things. He was onto a lot of very good ideas, but I don't know, he seemed to chicken out at the end. Um, this gamelan music and the reason I mentioned Schopenhauer is he says that Schopenhauer is the closest thing we have to, or music is the closest thing we have to pure will. This strikes me, this kind of music strikes me as a, a good illustration in as much as we're capable of uh, illustrating anything of this sort, of what it's like in the first person being in the information stream, Pyro's information stream, data stream. Reality just comes at us, as it were. It looks random and blind. Um, the existentialists say it's absurd. Um, 
a, a less, I don't know, playful explanation is, it's meaningless. Well, okay, let's say that we, let's say that we set aside for the moment any desire to put meaning on anything. Let's say that we want to experience that information stream, that data stream. And let's say we want to sort of not get overwhelmed by it. We want to understand the data stream. You first have to find some way to conceptualize it. You have to have something tangible. But the problem is the information stream is so seemingly random and absurd that there's nothing to grab onto. No, but you can draw pictures of it, as it were, in your own mind. Um, like this. I love this stuff. Meditate to it all the time. Um, Filipino music is, traditional music is similar to this. And it's, uh, I've heard a lot of it live. There's a reason why music develops along certain lines. The um, 18th century guys like Mozart and everybody, they were trying to sort of show order in everything, harmony. This music doesn't even have harmony. It doesn't even want harmony. In fact, harmony is kind of goes against the grain of what things like this are supposed to do. In a sense, I find this kind of music strangely refreshing in that it doesn't fit our ideas of musical order and form and structure. Um, because in a sense, form and structure are impositions. This is kind of an imposition. It's sort of a controlled chaos, a gamelan orchestra. But if you can sort of get into the headspace of the music in and of itself, don't get caught up in how good the musicians are, don't get caught up in the fact that it's exotic foreign music or anything like that. Just, if, you, if you're that sort of person that has that capacity, just, just let the music come at you and imagine it. Um, Inventive Harvest had his little, uh, you know, random computer-generated endless image uh, that he uh, pointed to as an illustration, a good illustration of uh, the information stream of endless, eternal, ever-present becoming. That's a really good illustration. My little screensaver, whatever you call it, for my um, for my uh, media player on my computer has that, and I love that. That's the visual version of endless becoming. This is the auditory one, or there are many kinds, I guess. It's kind of a it's kind of a cross between music and non-music. Again, jazz is like that, or at least the jamming kind of jazz is like that. Um, there's a reason, I think, why Schopenhauer put so much uh, store in music, why he said that music is pure will. Because we ourselves are utterly inconsistent. How many times do you curse yourself for the way that you acted previously? Not necessarily badly, maybe you should have acted badly, whereas you were showing forbearance. Uh, maybe you should have shown humility when you were extremely arrogant. And you look back and you evaluate yourself and say, that was wrong of me to do that. In a sense, we are this gamelan orchestra, our own consciousness. We're wildly inconsistent. No matter how often we try to beat ourselves into some kind of um, consistency, and I think that, in, in a, to a certain extent, we're, we're successful up to the, you know, the levels of bare necessity. Um, but we never seem to be able to control ourselves to the point where we're utterly consistent, even according to our own personal standards. We act in ways that we wish we didn't act, and it just keeps happening. <laughs> um, the will, I think, acts that way. It's going to do what it's going to do. <laughs> um, and I think that music like this 
enables us to conceptualize that. Tantra is big on music, by the way. Um, big on singing and jamming and stuff like that. Um, one of the nicer things you can do when you're in India is find a little neighborhood get-together of people who are um, singing bhajans uh, endlessly, sometimes for hours on end. Uh, you know, they might do this once a week, where they just bang their little cymbals and beat their drums and repeat the same mantras or song refrains or whatever over and over and over and over again to the point where it stops making sense in the Western way of listening to music. No variation. It's almost the same thing as this kind of jamming, but in another sense. Equally offensive to the Western ear to uh, as this kind of music, which may not be offensive to people, is endlessly repetitive music where you just, as I say, I have the capacity to listen to the same song over and over again and, not, and it won't drive me insane. Um, not many people in the West can do that. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I think that that too is, uh, is another sort of way of breaking out of the canon of what the universe should be. We want variety and we want order and we want them in good balance. That's our music, right? What if we have order but no variety? Or we have variety but no order? <laughs> I would say that we're a mix of both and we're, each side seems to be sort of fighting for control. There's the, the element of you know the Apollonian versus the Dionysian here. Um, this to me is Dionysian music. <laughs> Uh, the Apollonian, of course, would be, I don't know, Beethoven's Ninth or something like that. But it does, it is an interesting illustration of becoming um, chaotic, deliberately chaotic music. Um, it's one of my favorite kinds, and, and it, I, I particularly like Asian music for that reason, because no harmony, uh, in fact, they deliberately avoid harmony, and it's to me at least, far more intellectual. Um, you're sort of an active participant in the music, even though, even if you're just a listener. Because you have to pick out the little bits in the cacophony in your own mind that you're going to listen to, and that are going to mean something to you, and to you alone in the audience. I think that becoming works that way as well. We all pick and choose in reality. Um, we all choose our own building blocks in, to build our own reality, our own forms. Um, there's nothing wrong with admitting that to ourselves. And as I say, if you want to anchor yourself somewhere, if you want a place to stand, that's your good place to stand, the will. 